Um, so let me say uh, thanks to everyone for, for coming and joining us. It's a pleasure to have, um, actually, before I even get into the intro, what I'm going to do is share my screen and talk about the Delaware Valley Mass Spec discussion group for a moment. Sorry, I have a little bit of a glare issue. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, share. All right. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming um, on this Monday evening. And it is great to be part of the Delaware Valley Mass Spec Discussion Group. And first, what we wanna do is thank our sponsors, <clears throat> which I'm gonna go down here. Joe, you can hit the uh, you can hit the tabs on top. Sponsors, you can go directly to the sponsors. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah they are already. So good. Mobile Ion, Agilent, Bruker, Gentech, Ion Sense, Geol, Keystone, Lico, New Objective, NEMS, Phoenix S and T, Restec, Syax, Shimatsu, Adaptus, Thermo, Trajan, and Waters. Um, so thanks to everyone who supported the Delaware Rail and Mass Spec Discussion Group. Um, and we also want to direct your attention to the ASMS Travel Award that Stephen was talking about earlier. So if you've applied for that, we'll be reviewing applications soon. Um, and also want to advertise uh, something for a postdoc at <clears throat> Janssen. Um, so if you are into droplet-based high-throughput experimentation or DESI and high-throughput screening, uh, please contact Harsha um, and let him know. Um, and, so, and by the way, this is in collaboration with Professor Graham Cooks's lab at uh, Purdue. So uh, it's a joint postdoc position uh, that's uh, still we're looking for good candidates to join. Uh, I mean, to apply and see uh, who, can, who can make it. So please do take a look at the uh, course. Thank you. There you go. Um, and with that, it's, it's a real pleasure to introduce Matt Bush and to have him uh, come here and, and talk to us. Matt has got his PhD in 2003 and 2008 with Evan Williams and Richard Sekali at, at Berkeley. Um, during that time, he was using IR laser spectroscopy and FTIC RMS to investigate zwitter ion formation in gas phase biomolecules and the effects of hydration on biomolecular and multiply charged ion. Um, <clears throat> this was fantastic training in mass spec and physical chemistry. Um, and laid the groundwork for his continued pursuit of using gas phase techniques to investigate structures and interactions. In 2008, he joined Carol Robinson's lab uh, in Cambridge or at University of Cambridge and University of Oxford, where he was a Waters Research Fellow, uh, a junior research fellow of Jesus College, University of Oxford, and developed experimental and analytical frameworks for using ion mobility mass spec uh, to characterize structures of drug like molecules, peptides, proteins, and protein complex. He joined uh, the faculty at Washington in 2011. Uh, he's also a member of the Department of Biochemistry, Bio Biological Physics, Structure and Design Program, and the Molecular Engineering and Sciences Institute. So his group is focused on developing mass spec-based approaches for elucidating structures, uh, assembly, and dynamics of complexes. Um, he, and he, approves, he applies these to a wide range of systems um, with a focus on protein homeostasis. Uh, so with that, I'm looking forward very much to hearing more about new mass spectrometry-based technologies for biophysics uh, and structural biology. So with that, please take it away, Matt. Well, well thanks very much for the kind introduction uh, to speak here and uh, the overview of my bio. I will admit that after hearing somebody read it aloud, I think I'm going to provide you a much or people with much shorter statements in the future on that. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a great group here tonight. I recognize a few names in the audience. I'd really encourage people to ask questions as we go through. I'll try to monitor the chat window or uh, just chime in with any questions and look forward to intera our interactions. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, new mass spectrometry technologies for understanding the structure and functions of proteins. And what I've decided to do is based on some of the interests that Joe expressed beforehand is focus today on E3 ubiquitin ligases, which I'll tell you more about in just a moment. Uh, and here's a photograph of the University of Washington campus. Uh, the chemistry department is actually just right here next to this fountain. I will admit that this is more June, July weather. We're still uh, kind of in our overcast rainy time of the year. Um, but actually the amount of green that you're seeing here is pretty representative year round for us. It's a really beautiful campus. So I'm showing you here is an image of the inside of a cell, and this is uh, one of the classic David Good cell images. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize here is that cells are composed of many different molecular species, and one of the hallmarks of these are multi-protein complexes. And we notice here is that a lot of the things here in the image consist of multiple proteins that are assembling together to accomplish a more complex function. 
And that's really been the focus of my research interest for many years is developing mass spec tools to understand how these proteins interact with one another. And that'll really be the focus of the talk today. However, whenever I see an image like that, one of the other things I'm really struck by is there's so much going on and really every part of a cell is occupied by something. And this creates a lot of challenges. Um, so if you imagine when you, an environment gets really crowded, how do you know what's beneficial for that and what's no longer necessary? So Marie Kondo famously expressed one way of approaching this problem. And that is the best way to choose what to keep and what to throw away is to take each item in one's hand and ask, does it the spark joy? If it does, keep it. If not, dispose of it. This is not only the simplest, but also the most accurate yardstick by which to judge. So this is uh, great in our own lives, our own offices, trying to think about you know, what to keep, but how does a cell accomplish this task? One of the main ways that does this is using the ubiquitin proteasome system. And I'm not gonna go through the entire enzyme process, but really the key element of this is that these proteins work together to take a substrate, conjugate ubiquitin to it, which is a small protein. And these ubiquitin protein conjugates target the substrate for degradation by the proteasome. Uh, one thing I loved in this image was, uh, this was dubbed uh, the proteasome is the engine of destruction inside the cell. So the key thing uh, from my point of view on this is the actual E3 part of this process. And that's because the E3 selects which substrates are targeted through degradation through this pathway. So one way you can think about this is that human cells have something like 600 unique Marie Kondos that are each looking for different things and deciding whether or not to target that protein for degradation. And so really the idea here is that we have a network of about 600 different proteins that are involved in deciding which proteins should be kept in cells and which should be targeted for degradation via this E3 ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So I'm gonna to talk today about some aspects of the ubiquitin proteasome system and particularly the molecular specific aspects of it. And a couple of things that were pretty shocking to me when I started working on the ubiquitin proteasome system is that for the vast majority of E3s, there's no validated substrates, degrons, which are sequences that individual E3s recognize, are cofactors that control activities. So again, for most of these 600, we don't know what their specific role and how they're regulated. E3s are potentially druggable, but we don't have a general strategy for doing this. And E3s can be repurposed. And I think for this audience, where a lot of people are coming uh, from the pharma or biopharma world, there's a lot of attention placed to this right now, which is there's a new therapeutic strategy called PROTAX, or proteolysis targeting chimeric molecules, that are able to repurpose an individual E3 to enable it to target a new protein for degradation. So what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the technologies that my lab uses, and I'm going to try to give examples related to E3 ubiquitin ligase and this proteasome degradation system. A core technology in my lab is native mass spectrometry, and really what we got in, what we're interested in is trying to har harness the core strengths of mass spectrometry, so speed, sensitivity, and selectivity, in order to answer questions related to protein biophysics and structural biology. So let me describe a little bit of how we do this. Then I'm gonna give examples using uh, one protein involved in the human EPS. In our experiments, we're gonna start with a small volume of a protein in an aqueous solution. Typically the proteins at modest concentrations, and we're gonna use a relatively high concentration of a volatile electrolyte to help set the pH and the ionic strength of the solution. We can also add in things like metals and cofactors that are necessary for the correct function of our protein of interest. And the idea of these experiments is that we can create a physiological like environment and solution, and then using electrospray ionization, make nanometer scale droplets, which are relatively easy to desolvate and introduce to the mass spectrometer. Once they're in the mass spectrometer, we can use all the core tools of mass spectrometry to learn things about these ions. These include the stoichiometry, how many copies of each protein are in the complex, 
assembly, how these higher order structures are formed, interactions between molecules. Using ion mobility, uh, we can probe the shapes of proteins and protein complexes. And using other mass spectrometry approaches, we can learn about their sequence and identity. The first example I'm going to give is uh, related to some proteins that are involved in regulating our circadian rhythm. And so this is how our physiologic, physiology evolves over a 24 hour cycle. And the protein I talk about is one that um, I allowed to say quite a few years ago now with Ning Zhen, who's in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Washington. And Ning's lab have used tools, mainly X-ray crystallography to, to study E3 ubiquitin ligases for many years. What we're really drawn to with this question is that CRY2 is a core protein that makes up the circadian clock of mammals. And it's sequenced similar to other CRY2s um, in model organisms that have been used to understand circadian rhythm more traditionally. One key part about it is that CRY2 appeared to be regulated by this pair of proteins, FBOX3 and SKIP1. And these two proteins are E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so that means that CRY2 is a substrate for this E3 ubiquitin ligase. And the core question going into this project was what was the role of FAD in regulating the mammalian form of this protein? And let me tell you a little bit about it. The main model system for circadian rhythm are mung beans and fruit flies. And this is because you, we have a lot of genetic tools to manipulate them. And because the lifespans are relatively well understood, we can really understand the specific effects of molecular biology on them. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, CRY2 in plants. What's being shown here is mung beans that are grown in the dark and mung beans uh, grown in the presence of light. And so notice here is that when mung beans are grown in the dark, they continue on and you only have pale tissue. In contrast, when mung beans are grown in the presence of light, they rapidly will form this dipoid leaf structure and you see the appearance of pigmentation. In contrast, if you take mung beans and mutate one of the sites in mammalian cry 2, what you discover is that the mung bean, even in the presence of dark, goes ahead and forms this diploid leaf foundation, although it doesn't form um, the pigmentation. And so really the takeaway from this is that in, the in mung beans, this is a critical protein for the development of the mung bean and how it responds to light. One key aspect of CRY2 in plants is that it binds a molecule of FAD incredibly tightly to the point where um, this ligand can't be even dialyzed away from the protein. The molecule of FAD acts as a blue light receptor, and the, the blue light receptor in this case is associated with conformational changes in the protein and targeting the protein through degradation via an E3 pathway. Based on this information and the sequence similarity between CRY2 from um, mung beans and CRY2 in other organisms, the assumption was this FAD binding pocket would be pursue, uh, preserved across all organisms. Using native mass spectrometry, we found that mammalian CRY2 actually binds FAD very, very weakly. And so let me just walk you through this mass spectrum really quickly. In these experiments, we start off with a high concentration of mammalian CRY2 and incubate it with an even higher concentration of FAD before diluting it down with a concentration we could use for native mass spec. On the x-axis here, we have M over Z. In this case, the primary peaks in the mass spectrum correspond to mammalian CRY2 with excess charge on them. So for example, this 60 kilodalton protein with a 15 plus charge state appears near 4,000 M over Z. In this case, we see very little association of FAD. And this corresponds to um, at least a six order magnitude weaker binding for the mammalian protein band uh, for um, the protein from mung bean. This provided the first strong experimental evidence that the mammalian protein doesn't use FAD as a cofactor. 
even though it has all the same key amino acids that are associated with FAD binding in the plant protein. In this case, what's going on is that the, in the mammalian protein, although all the same residues are in this region, if you um, soak the crystals in a high concentration of FAD, they basically stick to the surface on a relatively planar region. Whereas in the case of mung beans, the FAD is bound in this very, very deep pocket. And so there's been a very large change in the structure of the protein in these regions, even though the same amino acids are present in both cases. So what I'm gonna do now is introduce another tool of structural mass spectrometry and talk about how we used it to learn about the intact complex between CRY2 and the E3 ubiquitin ligase that regulates its abundance. Here I'm showing is a native mass spectrum of mammalian CRY2, so the same protein from the preceding slides that was incubated with FBOX3 and SKIP1. There are two proteins that make up an E3 ubiquitin ligase. In this case, you're seeing a long series of peaks that correspond to the heterotrimer. In this case, we see very good agreement between the expected mass and what we observe experimentally. One thing that was interesting, though, is in this case, we have a bimodal distribution of charge, whereas in the case of uh, CRY2 on its own, we only saw a monomodal distribution or a single distribution of charge state peaks. In addition, there are these small peaks here of an asterisk on them. And I'll come back to those just briefly, but there are a, a consequence of protein. Uh, one of the proteins is partially degraded in the sample. What we then did is took this same sample of mammalian CRY2 and incubated with FAD. When we do that, we see a very large change in the mass spectrum. In this case, when we incubate the sample of one millimolar FAD, all of these higher charge state peaks are depleted, and we only see these lower charge state peaks. Interestingly, we see no evidence of FAD binding in these experiments. This is really a case of when we incubate the sample of FAD, um, we see these peaks decreasing, these peaks appearing, but no change in actual mass. This asterisk, which corresponds to a degraded form of the complex that's lost a three kilodalton part of one of the proteins, interestingly, it, it only forms these lower charge state peaks. Now, the next part of this story that was really interesting to us was that in this case, although we see no binding of FAD, if we dialyze the FAD out of the solution, this form will actually persist for several hours. And then over the span of say four to six hours, it will begin to re-equilibrate back to this distribution. So clearly FAD is doing something in the protein. And we believe this is due to um, long-term changes in, or a conformational change upon FAD binding that's very slow to re-equilibrate back out. What I wanna do is talk about how we can use eye mobility to understand more about this protein. So of course, now people have seen a lot of eye mobility talks over the years, but I'll just give um, you just the, the one minute version of it for this, this talk. Eye mobility is a rapid gas phase separation technique. And the key part of these experiments is that we're gonna put ions in the presence of an electric field and a gas. The electric field is gonna accelerate the ions forward. Collisions with the gas are it's gonna exert a counteracting drag force. The net result of this is that more compact structures have fewer collisions and move at a higher velocity, whereas more extended structures have more collisions that dampen the momentum, they move at a lower velocity. And so these more compact ions will have shorter retention times in the eye mobility region of the instrument, whereas more extended structures will have longer, longer arrival times. I, of course, have to introduce a couple terms when it, since we're dealing with ion mobility. The key equations are that the velocity of the ion is the product of the electric field that's applied and the mobility constant of the ion, which is an intrinsic property of the ion and the gas where the separation is performed. This mobility constant 
can be related to collision cross-section through this thing called the Mason-Schomp equation, which depends on some things like the temperature of the experiment, the gas pressure, here represented as a number density. And the key part about this collision cross-section is it depends on the overall shape of the ion. Um, one version of the collision cross-section I love was introduced uh, all the way back in 1925. And here it's being shown is a polyaromatic hydrocarbon here was cut out of a paraffin wax and placed on this device where the orientations of, of um, the polyaromatic hydrocarbon can be rotated in all three dimensions. Shining a collimated light source over this and then projecting the shadow, what the authors were able to do was determine or estimate collision cross sections for atomic models by cutting out these projections as a function of all orientations of the polyaromatic hydrocarbon. And to a FERC's approximation, that's what's happening in ion mobility. It's the area that's being presented to the gas as the ion moves through the separation. So let me show you some ion mobility results for this complex. So here I'm showing the native ion mobility mass spectrum of mammalian cry 2 and a complex of the E3 ubiquitin ligase. And what you'll see here is a series of peaks that correspond to different charge states of the heterotrimer. But you'll notice there's this very large discontinuity between the higher charge state peaks and the lower charge state peaks. Here I'm plotting the drift time of the ion. Let me show you what this looks like in terms of collision cross-section. On the x-axis is the charge state, so lower charge to higher charge. And on the y-axis is the collision cross-section of the protein ion with the helium gas that we use for the separation. What we observe here is that the lower charge state ions all have a collision cross-section of about 67 square nanometers. And this was consistent with the crystal structure that was subsequently solved by Ning Zheng and co-workers. In contrast, these higher charge state ions have collision cross-sections that are about 30% larger. We built, uh, in particular, Sam Marioni, who was a graduate student in my lab at the time, built a series of models to try to understand what this could be. And the main takeaway from this is that the only model we were able to construct that could have this very large increase in collision cross-section corresponded to this substantial domain migration of this protein, which is FBOX3, which makes up the main part of the E3 ubiquitin ligase. And what's happening here is this protein in the structure on the bottom makes kind of a C-shape. What we believe is happening is that the interface between the two halves of the protein is, is quite weak. There's relatively few interactions. And we believe that the protein is actually pivoting out like this. And that's what's enabling it to present such a larger area to the gas. So we believe it's really cool from uh, this set of studies is that we're able to understand uh, many of the interactions between the three proteins that make up this complex. And in particular, we're able to see that the two forms that we identify of the complex can be modulated through these transient interactions of a cofactor, even though we couldn't actually detect any evidence for direct binding or any you know, high affinity binding between the complex and the cofactor. Hopefully you all aren't hearing too many beeps going on. My computer really wants me to reset all of a sudden and is giving me like eight different warnings that I should do that. So hopefully that's not too distracting. Before I move on to the next part, are there any questions? Hi, Matt. I'll ask a, I'll ask a quick question because I'm curious. How often uh, are you misinformed by MD simulations against your empirical data? Yeah. So the short answer is a lot. Um, I think one of the things that we've found really helpful is using several different modeling approaches to basically build up an understanding of what's possibly consistent with the data um, and kind of rule out a lot of possibilities as well. So for example, in this study, one of the first suspicions that we had between these two forms was that since we saw that this truncated form of the complex, so it's missing three kill Daltons, couldn't form the extended species, that maybe somehow what was happening is one part of the protein was unraveling and that that unraveling tail was causing the large increase in collision cross-section. However, what we found was as we tried to unravel the, each of the termini of the three individual proteins, 
we couldn't get this large of an increase in collision cross-section without losing a whole interface between two of the proteins. So in essence, like using that simple hypothesis that like the, the chain is unraveling, we couldn't actually have a heterotrimer anymore. So I think it's sort of part of what we use, but I, I don't think it's definitive in any way, or it's not definitive in the cases that we've looked at. But I think that'd be a great thing to come back to at the end of um, today's talk as well. Great, thank you. Matthew, I have a question. Uh, you showed the degradation product in your spectrum, right? Is, is the substrate degrading? Uh, and is that solely has a uniform chart distribution, right? It doesn't uh, show the complex has two distributions. The degradation products have one distribution. Uh, yeah, let that... me go back to the mass spectrum really quickly. Yeah, this one? Yeah. Oh, sorry, so what was the question? So the one in asterisk, right, is that uh, you said they were degradation products, right, of the substrate, I believe. Is that what it is? So in this case, we were never able to identify this species on its own. Um, so we tried various tandem mass spectrometry strategies and weren't able to. What we believe was going on in this case is that these proteins were being co-expressed in insect cells, and we believed it was some protein degradation mechanism of the insect cells was causing that. Uh, so the expression system for the protein as opposed to it being um, uh, the protein, like th this protein actually causing the degradation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and one warning I'll actually give for people who work on sort of more bona fide proteins that need more complex expression systems, things like this of say insect cells degrading a protein of interest, I'd say are more the rule rather than the exception. So for example, one protein that we've worked on, which is a heteropentamer that was also co-expressed in insect cells, what we found is that the insect cells had caused degradation on all five subunits of the heteropentamer. Um, and these were very specific processes where the, the insect cells were able to act on these human proteins. Uh, I'm not sure if I answer your question. Maybe we can loop back to that as well later on. Yeah, and I was a little confused with this uh, E3 ligase being a, a mechanism for degradation. I was confused as to if the complex was also, like the complex was creating the degra degradation or whether it was something mm -hmm. that you just mentioned, whether it was an intracellular mechanism to produce this. Um, in this case, it was an intracellular mechanism. Um, we have tried to look at, at problems where our E3 is actually doing the, or is actually the bona fide degradation pathway. Uh, but I think that'd be a great thing to loop back to later on to, to chat about. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead to the, the next section, which is talking more about how E3s recognize their substrates of interest. And what I mean by this is which proteins do individual E3s target for degradation? And I wanna introduce two key ideas. The first is what's referred to as the N end rule. And this is that the in vivo half-life of a given protein depends on the destabilizing activity of its N-terminal residue. This primarily comes from work in yeast where they found there was a very, very high correlation between the half-life of proteins in yeast and its N-terminal residue. Another idea here is the idea of a degron, and this would be a short linear sequence that's recognized by a specific E3. And let me kind of compare and contrast these really briefly. A degron is really a property of a specific E3 and what amino acids in the, in the substrate it recognizes. In contrast, the in end rule is really how all of the ubiquitin proteasome system works together to regulate the overall protein degradation in a cell. But in terms of the importance of this degron code, what I want to emphasize is that we don't have, we don't know degrons for the vast majority of E3s. So we don't know what most individual E3s out of those 600s that humans have, what sequences they're recognizing. And this is particularly important right now because of this interest in this ProTac therapeutic strategy, because what it means is because we don't have degrons for most E3s, we're really limited by which of those E3s can be repurposed for this therapeutic strategy. 
And so one of the working hypotheses in my lab is that if we had a better understanding of degrons, so the individual sequences the E3s recognize, that would enable this protax strategy to be even used even more generally as an intervention. The protein I'm going to focus on today is called KLHDC2. And this is a relatively newly identified substrate receptor for E3 ubiquitin ligases. When this was identified through um, a high throughput screen, they identified three potential substrates, selenoprotein K, selenoprotein S, and USP1. And one of the most, in and one really interesting aspect of this is that the element that these three potential substrates have in common is they have diagalacine at their C terminus. This is really surprising because most of what we thought we knew about E3s was that they recognize the N-terminal end of proteins, whereas this appears to recognize something at the, at the opposite end of the protein. The story I'm going to talk about today started when we were approached again by Ning Zhang in the Department of Pharmacology. This was a then graduate student in his lab, Dominitsa Rusnak. Dominitsa was working on the structure of KLHDC2. And in particular, she was trying to, or she was crystallizing KLHDC2 that was incubated with a peptide that came from the N-terminal region of cell K. And here is um, the crystal structure that she solved. However, one of the questions that came up from this was that only a couple of the residues of cell K were clearly resolved in um, the actual electron density of the structure. And so a key question that came out was, was this actually the, the peptide of interest or something else? So the actual approach that Dominitsa used then was to try to crystallize this protein without incubating it with this peptide. And what she found was all of the crystals that she grew with the protein without incubation still had density in the um, substrate binding pocket. And so this appeared that regardless of how she tried to express or purify the protein, it was interacting with something from the expression system that was binding in that site. And this is when they approached us to try to understand what was bound to what was supposed to be their APO protein in this case. So what we're going to show you is done uh, by Daniel Kanzani, who at that time was a graduate student in my lab, who recently started a position at Talus Therapeutics here in Seattle. What I'm showing here is a native mass spect spectrum of human KLHDC2 that was expressed and purified from E. coli cells. And we'll see in this native mass spectrum, so here is our x-axis is M over Z. The base peaks of this mass spectrum correspond to the ABO form of the protein. But in addition, at slightly higher M over Z values, we see this kind of bumpy and wiggly region here that correspond to our protein plus some additional mass. And what I'm going to talk about now is the strategies that my lab used to identify what these features are, understand more of what KLHDC2 was interacting with. The first approach that my lab used was top-down native mass spectrometry. And what I mean by that is we would generate the protein peptide complexes from solution, subject those to CID, and look at what was being released at lower M over Z. And so I'm showing here is the peaks that appeared at lower M over Z when we do activation. We would then repeat this process using a pseudo MS to the three strategy, where we would release first release peptides at the interface of the uh, source. So a cone voltage activation at the beginning of the instrument. Isolate one of those individual peaks using a quadrupole and then fragment in a collision cell. And for example, this species here labeled X, subjecting it to MS3, we could generate these diagnostic fragments with this sequence. And these are being identified with unrestricted database searching um, from the expression system E. coli. So I guess one thing to emphasize here is one of the challenges we run into is that going into this, we don't have an a priori prediction of what the interaction partners would be, and we don't know what biochemical processes are giving rise to these species. <laughs> 
Just to confirm this assignment, we synthesized that peptide, also subjected to tandem mass spectrometry. You'll see here that the uh, fragmentation spectra are indistinguishable. Using this top-down beta mass spectrometry approach, we identified these species um, that were interaction partners of the protein in solution. One thing we love about this approach is that going through this MS3 approach, we have very high confidence that these species were interacting with the protein in solution, and these are bona fide, intera or bona fide interaction partners um, in the original cells where the protein was grown. However, using that approach, we weren't able to identify all of um, the species that were interacting with the protein. And so we used a couple complementary mass spectrometry strategies. One approach that we used was to take the sample for native mass spectrometry, either heat it, heat the solution up, or um, add organic solvent and acidify it in order to release things in solution that we could then identify using mass spectrometry. Using this approach, we did see some improved signal intensity for some peptides relative to our top-down approach, um, which helped us confirm some of our assignments, but we weren't able to identify any new species from that. What we then did was take the sample for native mass spectrometry, use solid phase extraction, and elute off the peptide components, and subject those to LCMS. And so one thing to emphasize here is that this is LCMS-based proteomics, but we're actually doing no enzymatic digestion. These are all species um, that were formed much earlier in the process, and then were being isolated on a protein of interest. Um, these were analyzed uh, using capillary chromatography on a QX active. Using this approach, we're able to identify this library of different species that were interacting with our protein of interest. Many of these were introduced uh, through molecular biology into the expression system, as well as proteins um, that originated from the E. coli cells where we raised the KLHDC2. And so you'll see here is uh, we're actually identifying a couple dozen um, different endogenous peptides that were interacting with our protein of interest. And what's really exciting then is if we took the masses of these species and mapped it onto the original native mass spectrum, what you'll see is that most of the bumps and wiggles of the original native mass spectrum, we can correlate to the protein of interest plus the mass of the peptide. And so this appears to be able to explain most of what we were seeing in the original native mass spectrum. One really intriguing aspect of this is that many of the interaction partners that we identified were actually a protein or a protein fragments of KLHDC2. And so in this case, what we're seeing is that KLHDC2 um, has this uh, um, wheel structure. And what we're seeing is, is that for um, five elements of this ring, we're seeing peptides in this interior region. And this is incredibly speculative, but one interesting aspect of this is this might be a self-regulation aspect of KLHDC2, that basically as the concentration of KLHDC2 goes up in a cell, this might be a mechanism by which it can target other copies of itself for degradation. In addition, just to show that these are really, um, that these affinities are significant, Here's just an example of uh, synthesizing one of the peptides that we identified using this hybrid mass spectrometry approach um, using a solution-based um, affinity assay. And we identified these, this is a very high level of bind or very tight binding of um, our substrate to the protein of interest. And interestingly, this level of binding is comparable to cell K, um, which is uh, one of the proteins that was identified through this high throughput screen of human proteins against uh, a KLHDC2. So a couple of other things that we learned about these interaction partners. What I'm showing here is a plot of the proteins in the E. coli proteome 
as a function of how many copies of the protein are in the cell. And then labeled here are various proteins that we identified fragments of bound to our protein of interest. And so one thing I wanna emphasize here is we're not just identifying the most abundant proteins in the E. coli cell. It really is that we're seeing what fragments are available in the cell that can interact with our protein of interest. So these span a very wide range of order uh, of dynamic, a very dynamic, wide dynamic range of relative protein copy number. And this was really important to us in terms of understanding these interactions, because one key part about this is this C-terminal diglycine or glycolalanine. And the reality is, is that 63% of E. coli proteins contain about 7,000 different GGs. And we're really seeing a very selective subset of that. Finally, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the quantitative things that we can learn from these experiments. And I think as this audience is very familiar with, um, electrospray ionization can introduce a lot of bias to, quant to the quantitation of peptides. And this is because ionization of peptides proceeds through this ion evaporation mechanism that depends strongly on things like hydrophobicity, sequence, and size. There are ways around this, for example, introducing standards and isotopic labeling. But typically, this requires a fair amount of knowledge going in in order to design experiments that have this that have robust quantitative properties to them. However, we're generating complexes between our protein and these peptide or these peptides or protein fragments in solution. And one key aspect of this is that ionization of protein peptide complexes is largely independent of the peptide identity. And that's because these protein peptide complexes are being formed through the charge residue mechanism, which is like other parts of native mass spectrometry. And the overall ionization really depends mostly on the protein, not the relatively small peptide that's bound to it. So let me show this in action for what we were trying to do. Here I'm zooming in on the native mass spectrum of KLHDC2 interacting with these protein fragments. One thing to note is if we zoom in on the APO peak, although it's quite sharp, it does have width to it. In addition, there are kind of these bumps and wiggles at higher mass. This is due to interactions with other species in solution, and particularly um, metal ions will interact with the protein and create these kind of satellite peaks to it, as well as the broadening of peaks as a function of the mass analyzer that we're using. Uh, in, this, in this case, this was a water synapse G2. The idea that we had was that in order to understand what's going on in this region, we would use the information that we learned about the 12 plus peak in order to make a template that we could then apply to these other regions of the spectrum. And so again, our hypothesis here is that all proteins and all protein peptide complexes have identical peak shapes. What we then do is shift our template by the mass of one of the interaction partners that we identified earlier. Repeat that for all the interaction partners that we identified, and then optimize the intensities to minimize the residual between the sum, which is shown here in purple, and the experimental spectrum that's shown in black. And so one thing you'll notice is that using this approach, we can reproduce much of the experimental intensity that we observed, even though it is a little bit of a blob, with a couple differences that indicate that there's a few species that we haven't yet identified as interaction partners. But what's really cool is that this appears to be highly reproducible. So here I'm showing just results from two technical replicates, but with um, use some other approaches to study the variance in these experiments. All you notice here is that the relative intensities of these interaction partners appear, appear to be very well reproduced in these different technical replicates, which are really telling us that we can get quantitative information out about the protein fragments that our E3 of interest is interacting with. One way that we've used this is by applying the standard addition method. We can take our sample, and titrate in a synthetic peptide and look at how it affects the relative abundance of the different species that are interacting with our E3. And so here's a, a standard addition plot of how much of the standard was titrated in 
versus the relative intensity of that species. And using this approach, we can estimate that the concentration of this peptide in the original sample was about 78 nanomolar. And so this really enables us to get quantitative information about this individual protein fragment that was interacting with our protein of interest. So to bring this all together, we're proposing this approach we can call degronomics. And really the idea of this is that we can start with E3 ubiquitin ligases grown in cells, isolate those complexes, and then using a combination of native mass spectrometry and other forms of mass spectrometry, including kind of variants of proteomics, we can bring this information together to both identify the interaction partners and quantify them. We believe this could be a really general strategy to unlocking the Degron code of individual E3s. We've now applied this to some other E3s, as well as KLHDC2 grown in other cells. And what we're seeing is that the results we get out are very dependent on both of those properties. So for example, for KLHDC2 grown in E. coli, which are the results I showed here, those are predominantly diglycal terminated protein fragments. However, when we grow those that exact same protein insect cells, we find that those are predominantly terminated by glycolalanine. And so that's really telling us that what we're probing here is both the intrinsic properties of the protein and what it can interact with, as well as what biochemical processes in the host cell are giving rise to these protein fragments. They're then being targeted by this E3, um, which in humans would then lead to the degradation of that protein. So, um, sorry, I had, a, I had a quick question. Um, yeah. So I was just wondering, um, based on the relative abundances that you see in the native data, if you compare those then to the LC data, do, like does it match? I know you were saying that the like there could be an influence of like electrospray ionization efficiency that could that could influence intensity there, but how well does that match up? They're really non-correlated. Um, I think I do have a plot somewhere I might be able to fish up at the end of the Q&A to show. Um, but for example, for peptides um, in an LCMS experiment, the ionization efficiency can vary by about at least three orders of magnitude. And our results were consistent with that, where if we plotted the relative abundance from the native mass spectrometry data versus like an extracted peak height from the MS1 data, those were really uncorrelated. So we really had like an R squared of zero for that. Um, okay, that thanks. Case. Yeah, no problem. No, I think, oh. This is interesting work. I, do you mind if I ask a question, jump in and ask a question related to this now that you're on this slide? Um, um, actually, if you don't mind, I think I only have like two more minutes. So maybe okay. I'll wrap that up, but let's, but you get the first question during the Q and A, how's that? <laughs> Sounds good. Thank so you. I was very cognizant. I was told to keep it to 45 minutes. So I'm going to try my best. <laughs> but you like the enthusiasm. Um, and so again, why we think this strategy is really important going forward is that we really think this is a much more general way strategy that could be used to identify Degrons. And really, this could unlock many more of these 600 E3s that we all have in order to use them for this ProTax strategy. Um, so here I just talked about one aspect of my research group. Uh, I think, you know, in a longer talk or, you know, if I start mixing and matching projects a bit more, other big parts of my group are we build instrumentation and particularly we're interested in right now are new approaches for multidimensional ion mobility mass spectrometry. So for example, here's an instrument that can, that does native mass spectrometry where we do one dimension of ion mobility that separates based on the structure and solution. We can then manipulate us, select ions of interest, manipulate them, and then analyze the effects of those manipulations through a second dimension of ion mobility before mass spectrometry. Um, and so where we're going with this now is doing more work where we can use light to interact with the ions in this region. We say many aspects of protein biophysics. Um, so areas of interest for me right now are understanding protein folding and particularly the unfolding refolding process and to what extent that's reversible in different proteins using temperature modulation and solution. We're now also doing a lot of work with protein cross-linking 
uh, particularly focus on, on how to probe less ordered regions of proteins, so things that are either classified as intrinsically disordered or other parts of proteins that don't show up in high resolution structures. And then finally, I just want to make a plug for one of your neighbors, Mobile Ion. And we're now using high resolution ion mobility, particularly to say lipid metabolism um, in cells. And finally, I just want to thank my research team, who, of course, do all this work. Uh, for the degronomics work, I really have to highlight the contributions of Daniel Kanzani, who really uh, you know, pioneered all of our, our progress in that area. And that's now being carried on by Lindsay Ulmer in my research group. Uh, these are the sponsors of this work. And now, Harsha, you get the first question. <laughs> OK, thanks, Mike. Great talk. Uh, going back to that slide that you showed here, yeah, this one. Uh, so the experimental data uh, match quite well with uh, the reconstruction, right, uh, of the various peptides. Now, you had several approaches where you uh, brought in uh, a comprehensive list of peptides, uh, some of which were MS3 approaches, some of which were you know, extraction and LCMS, I believe. Mm -hmm. So in terms of quantitation, I think the MS3 approach might not give you anything, right? So it's just value, right? Is that my understanding? Is that my understanding correct? Is, is the quantitation done purely on the LCMS data uh, or MS3 data as well? So for, so for what I'm showing here, we're specifically using the LCMS data to identify the interaction partners, and we use that to determine the mass that we shift this template by. But then these relative abundances are based solely on the native mass spectrometry data. So we're not using any of the quantitative information from the LCMS experiments. OK, got you. Okay. And we think that that really the value in that is that these relative abundances we think are strongly correlated with the relative abundances in solution. If we were to do quantitation based either on the MS1 or MS2 or MS3 data without doing any, you know, for example, external standards or internal standards, we don't think that we can actually correlate the absolute intensities in a meaningful way. Yeah. I mean, in the denaturing uh, mass spec, not native, uh, there is some efforts uh, put into trying to kind of reconstruct, uh, you know, intact data with peptide map intensities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, have you have you taken that approach? I, I think there's some arguments not to do it here for native, but uh, this is way off topic from what you've done here. But is there a good reasoning where you would uh, take that kind of approach where you can use peptides to reconstruct uh, intact MS profiles? I think. Here, I, I don't see a lot of motivation to do that because we think that the relative intensities in the native mass spectrum are very well controlled. Um, yeah, I think for quantitation, um, combining in um, your more skyline type approaches to the integration of, of synthetic standards, I think I have a lot of confidence in, but you have to have a lot of knowledge going into that experiment to design it correctly. Um, I think if, if I was following your question correctly, I think this is more um, using the LCMS data to, and then perhaps sequence, sequence information for ionization efficiency to try to get quantitative results. Sorry, I may have missed this. Yeah, part. no, it's, it's, it's like, you know, in pharma folks are interested in looking at a peptide map, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And then you do the same experiment, but at the intact mass of the same molecule. And uh, especially folks are interested in mapping post-translational modifications. So one of the major modifications for us is glycosylation. And you can see those mass shifts quite easily. I mean, it's easily distinguishable in an intact mass spectrum, but then there's also uh, delta masses that are not that significantly different from the intact uh, molecule, like mm -hmm. oxidations, deamidations, which are very hard to detect. 
in the intact spectrum, but uh, there are certain algorithms that can actually reconstruct based on peptide level information, the intact mass profiles based on mass shifts as well as okay. actual uh, intensity, relative intensities, not even absolute relative intensities. So it's using uh, uh, relative intensities from the intact protein yeah. to, okay. Yeah, so I think that um, in many ways that that approach is using um, similar ideas to this in that um, ionization of the, the peptides or, or post-translationally modified peptides goes to this ion evaporation mechanism where ionization efficiencies can kind of be all over the place. And then the proteins that are probably going through a charge residue mechanism where there should be similar ionization efficiencies for a wide range of species. The main difference is that in the native mass spec spectrometry experiments, because we're trying to preserve so many non-covalent interactions, the peaks are typically limited by the chemical heterogeneity of the species, not necessarily by the, the performance of the mass analyzer. So for example, um, in this spectrum, um, we actually have isotopic resolution of the peak at the top. Um, it, it's, we're kind of right at that limit there, but it's just that um, here we do have a 20,000 resolving power mass analyzer, but most of the shape of the peak is really due to sort of non-ideal effects of not putting a lot of energy into the ions and having very large ions for the mass analyzer that we're using. So we have pressure-based broadening that you wouldn't have for peptides. Um, so I think the approach that you're describing, I think both of us are trying to take advantage of differences in ionization mechanisms to get more quantitative information out. Um, the approach I'm showing here is really good when the quality of the mass spectrum is being limited by sort of many factors because we're able to use just the empirical shape of the peak, which is um, very um, uh, not homogeneously broadened and um, making assumptions that, that's, that those effects are being carried over to other parts of the, um, of the sample. And so like one, one part that you mentioned there is like, you know, if you have things like deamidation, oxidation and things like that, with the approach that we're using because we're using this template that spans over a pretty wide range of M over Z, this template will actually include those types of modifications in it. And we're basically uh, making the assumption that the complex with the protein fragment would also, the, the protein in that complex would also have those exact same modifications in it that are you know, kind of spreading out the, the, yeah. the signal. That, that assumption is kind of, you know, Kind of falls apart when the intensities are low, right? So your your hump on the right hand side with the peptide complex is significantly low in intensity, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm wondering whether those modifications or the ducts that you kind of alluded to earlier, all the sodium, potassium, calcium, that you you get the structure, the tailing of the peak, uh, how in terms of relative of intensities, I. I I don't know how much of that gets really translated to the, the complex. Uh, if Because there's also kind of convolution of, of the multiple peptides, right? Also on the complexes. So it's not like pure, uh, it's not well separated, I would think, right? And then there's some kind of convolution of the signals uh, on, on these multiple peptide complexes. So, so, but our, our <laughs> hypothesis is that, yeah, no, I think this could be a long conversation as well, but I think our hypothesis would be that, for example, um, if 5% of the APO peak corresponds to the potassiated ion, we think that the protein peptide complex, that 5% of that would have the potassium bound to it as well. And we think that this approach would capture that very well. Okay. But it sounds like if we were in person, this might be a half hour conversation. So. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.
along those lines, are, they, are there any other questions for, for Matt? I have about 100, but I'm going <laughs> to defer to everyone else. Go ahead, Chad. Right, I'll go. I think there's anybody, any other questions, so you can ask a hundred. All right, I'll go ahead. Uh, so one thing, you know, in, in your exchange with Harsha a second ago was a good indicator of this. It's hard to convince people of a new approach, you know, and especially when you don't have an easy gold standard to go against. So the first thing that I think of when I look at something like this is a CRISPR screen um, that's directed at E3 ligases. Is that something that you guys have investigated to see, okay, are these... Are, are, are these the true degrons that we see in person? If we knock this out, do we see an elevated amount of these particular proteins and the peptides from which they're derived? So the, so we have not done a screen like that. Um, I think that the big benefits that we get here are that these are molecules that were actually interacting with the protein. One of the challenges that comes up in the high throughput screens for this is that because humans have 600 E3s, there's a lot of duplicate function. And so in many cases, when you knock out one of them, you don't see that downstream effect, at least at these sorts of levels that you could use for this purpose. Um, for, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of gold standard, I think the other aspect of this is that if there was an easy way to get the gold standard measurement, we would know the Degrons for all the E3s. We have sort of partial evidence from high throughput screens, but I think that, that at this point, the, the ubiquitin ligase community feels like you'd really have to go through and validate those to know how meaningful they are. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, thank you. And, and, you know, along the lines of the quantitative aspect, I think the qualitative implications of this are enormous. <laughs> Understanding exactly <laughs> which substrates are being targeted by which E3s is like you've, like you've talked about something that we really don't know that well. Um, another question that comes to mind is, when you start looking at E3s, particularly multi-component protein complexes that have E3 ligase activity, how often do you run into situations where you're limited by your analyzer and detector? And is this something that something like the Coval-X detector has, has changed? or or Because I've seen some things that look at very high mass complexes using aldehyde cross-linking and things like this. Is this something that you guys have done or do you lose too much activity uh, when you try and do that artifactual modification? So... My answer to this has actually changed quite a bit in the past two or three years. And part of that is for a lot of the studies that I was doing on E3s five years ago, we weren't really taking advantage of mass resolution at all. We were just trying to see interactions and we could do that with lower mass. We didn't need even the 20,000 mass resolving power of a QTOF to do that. But now, we're asking a lot more questions where, for example, here we're looking at sort of this whole ensemble of protein fragments simultaneously. So we really want to have as you know, high performance of a mass analyzers we can use and still pre preserve this information. And also we're doing more work with cofactors and understanding which cofactor is actually modulating activity. And for many of those questions, the candidates that we have are close enough in mass that we really need to be able to suss out um, much smaller differences. So, um, so I, yeah, I think we have a little bit of a balancing act there. Um, the other part that I'll add to this is that many of these protein complexes that we're working with um, are much more delicate than a typical biotherapeutic would be. And so some of the approaches that I think work well on say like an antibody don't work on a complex like this. Um, another challenge that can come up is actually just the protein in solution and whether we have a construct that's well behaved in solution. Um, and I'll just you know, tell one quick example of this one, one moment. Um, 
So this is uh, just going back to the beginning of the talk where we had mammalian cry two on its own. It turned out when we tried to work with the full length construct of the protein, it was very unstable in the expression system and one end of it was being degraded. And using native mass spec, we were able to figure out what region to cleave off in order to have a, a form that was actually stable for biochemical assays. But then the next problem that we ran into was that mammalian cry 2 on its own is actually only soluble in 800 millimolar ionic strengths. In contrast, if you work with the heterotrimer, so this is mammalian cry 2 in this complex, it's stable in sort of a much wider range of ionic strengths, probably from 100 millimolar to 300 millimolar ionic strengths about any problem. Um, and so oftentimes when we're designing these experiments, we're trying to balance keeping things stable in solution with what you might prefer in order to get sort of the easiest to interpret mass spectra at the end. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, um, but at yeah, least those yeah. are some of the factors that we've been thinking a lot about. No, I think absolutely, absolutely that answered my question. Are there any Matt, other questions for Matt? Matthew, I have a question regarding that same spectrum, if you can go back. Um, so uh, so this, this complexity, right? I mean, there's a number of ways you can simplify, right? Uh, I know academics like to show the raw spectra, industry likes to deconvolute masses and show what the plus one charge mass looks like, uh, easy interpretation, right? Easy on the eye. Uh, but beyond that, have you considered doing some kind of proton transfer chemistry to you know, simplify the charge, see if there's anything underneath those uh, in addition to what you've kind of reconstructed uh, in this approach? Is, is proton transfer some way you can, you know, yeah, <laughs> I can actually have a whole talk on that topic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, one thing my lab has been really interested in is using ion ion chemistry for proton transfer reactions. And in particular, what we're interested in is that um, if you notice, like in this native mass spectrum, which I would say is a very typical native mass spectrum of a well folded protein that has a mass in this range you actually have very few peaks in the mass spectrum. And this has a big implication because if you have a protein that gives you relatively wide peaks and you only have three or four peaks to work with, in many cases, you can shift your charge state assignments by one and still get good fits to the data. So one way we've been using this is to basically take a native mass spectrum and instead of having three or four peaks, use ion chemistry to generate 10 different peaks or 15 different peaks. And then our ability to accurately assign a mass, um, basically we can unambiguously assign charge states, which in turn means that we have much more confidence in the mass value. Um, so for example, we've used this approach on, um, this is unpublished, but on uh, different commercially available IgGs and really convinced ourselves that there's charge state assignments in the literature that are off by one on that. And when you look at the data, it's understandable how that happened, but then when we do the ion chemistry, uh, that becomes pretty unambiguous. Um, I think you know, in terms of you, your question on the, the deconvolved versus the raw mass spectrum, um, the, the person who's, who's done probably the, the best job in recent years on this for native mass spectrometry is Michael Marty at the University of Arizona. And he has a, a, um, a software package that does Bayesian deconvolution that's been very successful for that. I think I'm still in the camp where I prefer showing the native mass spectrum, at least at the beginning, because um, that's had the, the least processing of it. But as a course, when you start showing like a zero charge spectrum, there is some risk of having artifacts in that. And sometimes some features get emphasized over other features as you go through that algorithm. Um, so we've always been very cautious of that in our workflows. I was I was thinking ion transfer, ion, ion reactions, proton transfer reactions in terms of improving the signal to noise, right? Um, of of that uh, with the complex as you were seeing in the more complicated, you know, peptide complexes. Um, 
Um, you know, if, if that can have any benefit to kind of your assignments as well as, um, you know, the, the experimental fit was pretty good, but I, I, was, I was wondering whether there's something else that's maybe uh, missing of the number of peptides. I mean, the yeah. fair number of peptides that were detected, but I'm wondering whether there's something else. So one challenge is, um, in terms of trying to use ion ion chemistry for that is, Ion, ion chemistry is really great when you have overlapping species that have different charge states. So when you charge reduce them, so they shift to, I'm not sure if I'm going left or right on the camera right now, but yeah. as you They're shift to the higher M over Z, they appear at different places because they have different shifts as you change their charge. However, if you have overlapping species that have the same charge on them, when you reduce the charge by one using ion ion chemistry, they both shift over and at least on a time of flight mass analyzer the resolving power is essentially independent of charge state and so you don't actually improve the resolving power when you do that in terms of improving the, the quality of a mass spectrum um, a native mass spectrum that's really complex like this one of the big limitations that we're, that we're running into is actually a pressure-based broadening where for a peptide ion that's pretty small, on this instrument, it's safe to assume that the TOF is a collision-free environment. For protein complexes, that is no longer a safe assumption. And almost all of this effect down here um, is due to scattering that's in the time of flight. So for example, if we just had a lower pressure time of flight, that would be much better for this specific application. And I would say like a couple of years ago, I just didn't care about this. But now on these projects, I'm starting to care about that a lot more. I mean, I, I was thinking in terms of ion parking. I mean, you, you can definitely improve the signal to noise, right? If you have those capabilities with proton transfer, you know, you don't have enough charge manipulation, you have a plus 12, but I'm just wondering if, if you were to have a technology that can increase the concentration of ions, whether that would improve the peak shapes and ability to okay. detect things that are low abundance. Um, so from that standpoint, that, that, that was what I meant. Okay. Um, I'd say in this case, because in our precursor spectrum, all of our signal is only across three or four charge states. So actually for this specific case, all of our signal is over three charge states, um, the 13, 12, and 11. And so here, there's probably not that much to gain from signal and noise from ion parking, whereas in a denaturing spectrum, when your signal gets spread out over 20 charge states, there's a big gain to be had from that. Um, here, we actually have very, very high signal to noise in the data. The issue is we don't have very high resolution between the peaks. Um, so that's really what's limiting us. So um, we can acquire a spectrum like this in a few seconds and using two microliters of solution, if we need to, we can signal average for 30 minutes or more. Um, so we can really drive down this, or we can really increase the signal noise of the data, um, but we, uh, we're really limited by the mass analyzer, not the signal to noise. Thank you. All right, I see we have a couple minutes left and I, I'll, I'll finish with, with uh, one quick question and one quick comment. So first of all, the, the numbers in terms of the sample consumption for a well-behaved protein construct look really good for the type of things that we would do for ligand binding assays. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, how, how far off do you think it is until mass specs are our ligand binding assay? Um, and then I also just wanted to comment that this was the first, hopefully not the last talk where I see pictures of Marie Kondo several times. Uh, in, <laughs> In the mass spec talk. So thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. Um, so in terms of sample consumption for ligand binding assays, um, in ideal cases, it's extremely low. Um, so if you picture a lot of the experiments I'm showing here, the whole experiments were using two or three microliters of, of two micromolar solution. So that's really great. Um, one of the limitations is if you're starting off with a crude material, you can't start with two microliters of two, two micromolar solution, do buffer exchange and sample handling and still have material at the end. 
And so typically, just because of the volumes that you need at the beginning for sample prep, and this is really buffer exchange is the, is the driver of this, you have to start with more material just so you don't lose it as you go through your, your pipeline. What can help a lot, I think, for ligand binding assays is that you can do your sample prep at the beginning and then do your ligand addition on very small volumes at the end, which I think is great. Um, another approach that I think can be quite powerful is combining multiple ligands in with one protein and doing more competition-based assays between them. Um, and I think there's great examples um, uh, you know, from other labs on this. And one in particular I'd like to highlight is some work from um, Alex Donald, who's in Australia, where he's been able to um, interact proteins of whole cell lysates and then using an approach uh, using submicron electrospray emitters identify the interaction partners to that protein from whole cell lysates, which I think is exciting. Um, the final part of this, though, is just in general, could this replace all ligand binding assays? Um, I think it depends like what information you want to get, get out at the end. So if you want thermochemistry, you know, obviously you're going to want to do a calorimetry-based approach. Uh, but I think the mass spec assays can be very powerful, particularly if you Design like if they if you go in with the right design principles. So, for example, um, what we've found in my lab is all the times that we've tried to measure a delta delta G. So, a you know not just a change in free energy, but a change in change of free energy. We I think can get results that are um, really beyond what you can do with any other approach. But if you need to get an absolute delta G out this may not be the best approach. So it kind of depends on how you're going into the study and what information you're trying to draw from it. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, well, I think we're right at about 6.15, maybe a little bit later. So um, let's everyone thank Matt very much for, for giving us this great talk. Very much appreciated. Um, I personally look forward very much to seeing that tandem ion mobility um, experiments and seeing a lot more coming out uh, from your lab with that. So thank you very much. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch and look out for more great stuff coming out from Matt Bush's lab. Thanks a lot, Matt. Well, and thank you for the invitation. It was really great to interact with everyone. Um, and I've, I actually haven't done a virtual talk in a little bit. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's an adjustment getting back to that as well. Um, so I hope everyone has a great evening. Um, and yeah, if there's any other questions, um, you know, anything else, feel free to reach out to me after the fact as well. Fantastic. Thank you very right. much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.